today we have a special guest. I would call him an icon. His name is El Paso Mayor Tommy Ambrosino. Tom, welcome. Thank you very much, much. Morris. Pleasure and I will call here. you Mr. Mayor from now on. Yeah. And he is the executive director of the Massachusetts Judicial Court. Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. Yes. Please elaborate on that and tell us how you like your new job. Uh, well, the Supreme Judicial Court is the highest court in Massachusetts, so it's the highest appellate court, sort of equivalent to the United States Supreme Court for the S Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And uh, my job is really sort of an administrative job to help the Chief Justice uh, run that court and help him as he administers the entire court system because the Supreme Judicial Court, in addition to issuing legal opinions right. uh, to determine what the law of the Commonwealth is, the Supreme Judicial Court in this state is also the head of the judicial branch. So it has sort of administrative oversight over everyone that works for the judicial branch. And the judicial branch is made up of many different trial courts and it has about 6,300 employees. So it's a very big operation. And the Chief Justice of the Supreme Judicial Court, whom I work for, he is the head of that system. Now, a lot of his supervisory powers are delegated to a Chief Justice of the Trial Court, uh, which is really the biggest part of the system, and a new civilian court administrator, who some people in Revere might know. It's Harry Spence, who was formerly the receiver for the city of Chelsea when they were in receivership. So he has a lot of administrative experience. So my job is to sort of assist the Chief Justice in overseeing that administrative aspect of his job and to work in collaboration with the trial court with Harry Spence and the Chief Justice of the Trial Court. So it's a very interesting job. It entails a lot of work, but so far I'm liking it. I've been there about a year and a half, and uh, I would say it's an enjoyable place to be. First of all, I want to thank you for being our mayor for 12 years in the city of Revere. Well, I, I very much enjoyed being the mayor of the city of Revere. I'd have to say it was probably the most rewarding job that I've ever had in my life. And uh, it was a job that I worked very hard at, but I got a great deal of joy out of. And you did a great thing. You made, did many great things. Well, and our new mayor, he's taken over where you left off, and he's continuing to do great things, too. It seems as though the city continues to move forward, and I'm very glad to be a resident of the city. And we're glad to have you. Well, thanks. But I would like to ask you about the judicial system as a layman. With the lowest court, the different levels of the court, could you explain to me how that works? Yes, yeah, so... Starting with the, like, for example, I get a speeding ticket, I go into Chelsea Court. Right. So let me try to do this in a way that's uh, explainable. There, the s most of the court system is what we call the trial court system. It's the place where most of the residents come in and interact with the court system. There are seven trial court departments, so seven different trial courts. There's a, and they all sort of operate on a level where uh, regular citizens interact with the system. So the seven departments of the trial court are, the first one is the district court. That's the local district courts that exist all across the Commonwealth, one of which is Chelsea District Court. Okay. So those district courts handle, for the most part, most relatively minor criminal cases. They handle appeals of traffic tickets. They uh, may handle some uh, small civil matters. They handle small claims matters. So most of the relatively small criminal matters and small civil cases and small disputes that people have tend to end up in their local district court. And that's the district court department of the trial court. That's one of seven. The second one is the probate and family court department. That's where people go who are going to look for a divorce, or they're trying to adopt a child, or they're looking for guardianship over someone who's having a difficult time. So most family issues get, uh, uh, get uh, heard and adjudicated in the probate and family court. They also handle wills and That's estates. What I was gonna, right. Uh, so if you have any issue with your will or you, wanna, you want to get your will finalized, 
then you would do all that business in the probate and family court. So that's the second department. Then there's a third department, which is the land court. The land court handles mostly land disputes, so people fighting over a zoning issue or a dispute over a boundary line. Those things end up in the land court department. And so these are kind of specialized departments. So the judges in the land court know lo land court law very well. They're sort of experts in that field. So you go into these departments and your case is being handled by a judge with particular expertise. So I've mentioned three, the district court, the land court, the probate. probate and family court. Then there's the juvenile court. That's a specialized court that handles juveniles. Those are defined in our law of children who are under the age of uh, 17. Once you're 17 or above, you're considered an adult for the judicial system. That is about to change. Well, there is a proposal to change that and to give the juvenile court jurisdiction for people who are up to 18 years of age. And there's some legislation right now pending in the legislature to do that, which seems like it's going to pass. But for now, it's 17 and uh, it's under 17. So they handle things that involve uh, children, juveniles who get into trouble with the law criminally, juveniles whose family situation is such that they need some services from the court, what are known as chins cases. So that's what the juvenile court I is. want to ask you about the juvenile court. Uh, yeah. If a juvenile gets a record and he's under 17 and he serves his time, does that record get wiped off completely? You or is it still in the background? That juvenile court records generally are not accessible but they don't, they don't get eliminated from the system. Oh, they don't get wiped off. Right. But you can't typically get access to juvenile records if you're doing a, for in most situations, you can't get access to juvenile records. But you're asking me some specifics about a court that I really don't have a whole lot of familiarity with. The juvenile court is, uh, is a specialized court. I was asked court. that by a certain woman whose son had a little problem, and uh, I told her you were coming on, Yeah, and she told me to ask that. Well, I wish I had a more definitive answer. There, no, that's good. Someone can answer that question for her, someone who practices a lot in the juvenile court. I don't profess to be an expert in any of these courts, although my practice before I was mayor tended to be in the district court, so I know that court a little bit better. I never did any juvenile court work, so I don't have a great deal of familiarity with Thank juvenile God, court law. Well, I know. <laughs> All right. So I mentioned the district court. I mentioned the probate and family court, the land court, the juvenile yeah, cool. court. There's a housing court. That handles mostly housing matters. So mostly landlord-tenant disputes or disputes involving code enforcement those get handled in the housing court. So that's another specialty department of the trial court. Uh, the, f the f sixth uh, court is the uh, Boston Municipal Court. Very similar to the district court, except it's limited to the jurisdiction of the city of Boston. It's really an urban court. Here's the majority of uh, urban cases arising out of the city of Boston and that's the Boston Municipal Court. Then the final department is the Superior Court. That is the court that handles the large-scale trials, like large murder. civil cases, large criminal cases, like murder cases. All the murder cases get handled in the Superior Court. All the major felonies where people are indicted, those are crimes handled in the Superior Court. In large civil cases where large sums of money are involved, those get handled in the Superior Court. There's a threshold that I don't even remember now th that distinguishes a civil case where the jurisdiction is exclusively in the Superior Court. It's usually large amounts of money in excess of $25,000 that are at dispute. Those get handled in the Superior Court. So those are the seven departments of the trial court. When people get their decision in that court, they tend to appeal their cases to the appellate courts, and there are two appellate courts in Massachusetts. There's the Massachusetts Appeals Court, and then there's my court, the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. Most cases get appealed to the Appeals Court, and then my court takes certain cases on a discretionary basis. 
So basically what my court will do is that they will examine the cases that get appealed to the appeals court and they will try to pluck from those cases the ones that are most significant for the Commonwealth and they will decide on their own those cases and bypass the appeals court. So they do that in two ways. Sometimes the court on its own will say we like that case, we're going to hear it up here instead of the appeals court hearing it. Sometimes the parties on their own will say this case has so much significance we're going to ask the court to hear our case so that we can bypass the appeals court and those cases are called direct appellate review cases. So my court for the most part will handle cases that don't get heard in the appeals court. They take them directly from the trial court. Sometimes on fairly rare occasions the Massachusetts appeals court will hear a case, decide the case, and then my court will take it on what's called further appellate review. So the appeals courts heard it, they've issued a decision, nonetheless the Supreme Judicial Court will say we think either that decision was wrong or we want to consider that decision and they will take it after it's already been through an appeal. And that's how my court gets cases. There is one other interesting way my court gets cases and that is through what's called their review of first-degree murder cases. Every first-degree murder case gets reviewed by the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. Which you were part of. Yes. And I'd like to ask you a question, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Yes, but I want to tell you an interesting fact about their review of first-degree murder cases. That came out of the Sacco and Vincente. Uh, right, in the 20s. Yes, because that case in, it generated so much controversy the legislature passed a law which says every first degree murder case has to be considered by the Supreme Judicial Court and they do a full review of that case. They read the whole transcript to figure out is there anything in that whole case which would justify overturning the verdict of first degree murder and a life sentence. And so every first degree murder case that uh, someone was convicted of first degree murder gets automatically reviewed by the Supreme Judicial Court. I'd like to ask you a question. I don't know if it's an sure. intelligent question, but it'll be a question. Yeah. The Whitey Bulger case, I'd yeah. like to talk about him for a minute. All right. He said he had an immune system from the FBI that he can go out and commit murders. I never heard of anybody, uh, a federal law or uh, even a state law, allowing me to go out and commit murders. Is he going to be coming before your Supreme Judicial Court? No, because he's been indicted on all federal charges, oh. no state charges. So his case is being handled not in the state court system. His case is being handled in the federal court system, which is an entirely separate system. So he's got, fed, he's been, he's been indicted for violating federal laws and as a result He's, being, he's going to be tried in federal district And the state court. will have nothing to do with the him at all? They will have nothing to do with him at all. Now, there may be some state charges against him. I don't think there are, and frankly, the federal charges are so significant that I don't think the state is pursuing any charges against him. But right now, all the things that you're reading about, those are matters that are being handled in the federal district court the Moakley Courthouse on the waterfront. That's a completely separate system from the state court system. So my court, none of the state courts have anything to do with the Whitey Bulger case. That defense he's raising that he has immunity uh, right. to go murder people. I never heard of it. It's a very interesting defense. I don't, I think the the federal government, the prosecution, the U.S. Justice Department is taking the same position as you, which is there's no such thing. You can't be granted immunity to go murder of people. Of course not. But a judge is going to rule on that as to whether or not he was granted immunity. So that will be, so some judge will decide that issue. Right, but I don't see any judge would have to decide it because murder is illegal to begin with. So he's, a judge is going to be deciding something that is already illegal? I'm asking you this. A judge is going to decide that issue. It does seem like it's a long shot for him to prevail on that argument, but a judge will decide that issue. <laughs> and whatever the lower court judge decides will certainly be appealed to the federal appeals court. 
They have an appellate system very similar to ours, an intermediate appeals court, and then appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, now I'd like to ask you about your personal. You're all, people don't know that about you, Mr. Mayor, but I'm going to let them know. You are a Harvard graduate. I graduated. One of the best schools in the country, if not the best school in the country. So, well, so just to be clear, I graduate, I, as an undergraduate, I went to Boston University. I then went to Harvard for my law school education. So I'm a graduate of the Harvard Law School, not the undergraduate. Okay. But and that was a great education. I'm really. Did you practice law before you became mayor? I did. And uh, tell us some of your famous cases. Then. <laughs> well, nothing that made the newspaper. That's all uh, right. But I practiced initially in a large law firm in Boston, then was known as Palmer and Dodge. Now it's uh, it's merged with a couple of other firms. I think their name right now is Edwards Wildman. Uh, but in any event, they were a big Boston law firm. I went there when I first got out of law school. I practiced there for eight years, and I was a litigator. I did trial work, so I tried cases. Although, like most big firms in Boston, they don't actually do a lot of trials because they're so expensive. Most of those cases settle out of court, uh, and that was true of most of the cases I worked on, although I did try a handful of cases while I was there. I left, I worked there, I graduated from Harvard Law School in 1986. I worked at Palmer and Dodge from 1986 to 1994. And then I opened my own solo law practice here in Revere, right here in this same building that you are in, and I, that your studios are in, 385 Broadway. I had a law practice in this building, a small office, solo practice. I did just about everything. I did court-appointed criminal work in Chelsea District Court and East Boston District Court. I did uh, wills and trusts and Medicaid planning. I did, I, tr I did civil cases and tried some of them and had a few interesting trials as a sole Can practitioner. Can you tell us one of them without naming a name? Uh, had, an interesting, uh, had an interesting case involving a lobster, a, comp a lobster company that did shipping of lobster all over the world and got into a business dispute with another uh, company that uh, uh, was trying to get into the same business and they got into a commercial dispute and I tried that case before uh, in federal district court for about three or four days and got a verdict in favor of my client. Then I had a very interesting case. Please do. Uh, this was a case involving a Ponzi scheme. My client was a, a minister from Texas who invested a million dollars wow. in what turned out to be a Ponzi scheme. And he sued not the person that uh, got him into the Ponzi, not the person who was uh, sent to prison for the Ponzi scheme. He sued someone in Massachusetts who was an early investor and made a lot of money in the Ponzi scheme. How does that work, if I may ask you, sir? It was a very interesting case because it involved some interesting laws, but the bottom line was those people who made a lot of money in the Ponzi scheme, even though they didn't do any, they were innocent, but they got paid lots of money out of the Ponzi scheme, were liable to people who lost money. Their ill-gotten gains had to be returned to the people who lost money. And I think that similarly has played out in the Bernie Madoff case. I think in that case, there were lots of people who lost lots of Billions money. Billions with him. Right, but there were also people who made a lot of money investing with him and got out before he got caught and pulled out lots of money. And, they're and those responsible? people are being sued by some of the late investors because their money that they earned was not honestly earned. It was part of a Ponzi scheme. So I think what's happening in that case is similar to what happened in my case, although at a much bigger scale, my case involved relatively small amounts of money. Like I said, my client ended up losing maybe a million dollars. Wow. We ended up settling that case after it went up on appeal uh, 
for a few hundred thousand dollars, if my memory serves me right. Right. Now, yeah, so we those were interesting cases that We I got did. you down from the judicial court. We got you to Harvard School. Now I want to get you back in the city of Revere. After you got finished with your law practice in this building, how did you get into politics and then become mayor of the city of Revere for the best 12 years? Yeah, those were the those were good years. Well, I always was in politics, even when I was, after I got out of law school and was practicing law at Palmer and Dodge, the big firm, I was, I was, I ran for school committee, so I, and I won. So I was on the school committee here in Revere for six years and really enjoyed that. And then that was from 1990 to 1995. Then an opportunity presented itself to run for city council, and so I did that, and I won, and I was an at-large city councilor for uh, four years, two terms. Oh. I sat on the city council, and then I ran for mayor in 1999 and won that and was mayor from, 19, from 2000. The election was in 1999. I started uh, as mayor in early 2000 and was mayor until the end of 2011. You must have done a terrific good job because the superintendent of schools, Mr. Paul Dagan, was voted the number one superintendent in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Well, that certainly is a decision that I was very proud of, having selected him as part of uh, that uh, uh, decision to select him as superintendent. I was the mayor at that time. I think we made the right selection. I think you did too. He's been a great superintendent. And uh, I often say, you know, sometimes I think people in Revere don't realize the respect our school system has outside the borders of Revere. I think its reputation outside the borders is far greater than its reputation within the city. I agree. It I'm is with that such too. a well respected system in the Department of Education, and Paul Dakin is such an incredibly well-respected superintendent. That's why the city of Revere School Department has gotten so much money in grants and innovative programs because the state knows it's a great urban system. I gotta tell you, this past week, we honored uh, the uh, slaves. Uh, oh yes, the in the Rumney Marsh, Marsh right. Ground. Yes. There was a gentleman that came up there, his name was Mr. Wolfgang. And yes. who travels all over the state. Yes. He gave us the biggest honor that any city could receive by saying that no matter where he goes, we are the best. Wow. And we are. Well, I think Revere, and not just in its school department, re its reputation is very good outside the borders of this city. I know that when I was mayor, we were very well respected in various state agencies of government in the governor's office, at the state house. I mean, again, part of the reason why we were able to generate so much money for the city, grant money that allowed us to build the parking garage right. at Wonder Inn, the pedestrian bridge at Wonder Inn. The new you know, schools. The new schools is because the state trusted that we would spend our money wisely and that we were good p custodians, uh, uh, good public servants. And so they were pleased to, to funnel uh, public funds our way. Right, I gotta tell you, uh, I've lived in Revere, I've been married 63 years, so I've lived here 64 years. And uh, there were mayors before you, there was a mayors after you, but you know, the things that you did in 12 years was quite an accomplishment, Mr. Mayor. Well, th I'm very proud of what we accomplished, especially all the building we did. We got, you know, we did a lot of schools. We, we got started four a new police the, station, a new fire station. We got station. a new police station built. We got two fire stations, stations built. We got the beach built up to the point where good developers now are anxious to do business there. So I think that we laid a, v I, I'm proud of the fact that I was part of an administration that laid a great foundation for the city's future. I think that's being carried forward by this current administration. And I think there's only great days ahead for the city of Revere. We only have a couple of minutes, so I'm going to ask you one more question, okay. and then I will wrap it up. We want to get a casino in Revere. Yeah. Yep. How does that look to you as from the Boston? Well, I've always been a proponent when I was mayor of a, of a casino. And I I'm with you on that. I thought Suffolk was an appropriate location. It has a history of gambling. Uh, uh, there's a great need for jobs in this city, which right. will be generated by a casino. 
and the amount of money it will bring into the city of Revere, I think, will be very beneficial to a city that often struggles to make ends meet a min I as a municipality. So for all of those reasons, I always favored a casino. I thought Suffolk was a great location for one. Who knows what the State Gaming Commission is going to decide, but I still, as an objective observer, would say this site makes a lot of sense to me, and I think at the end of the day it will make a lot of sense Do you to know the when that decision is going to be coming down? It's been dragging out now for months. Only, I only know what I read, same as everyone okay. else, but it sounds like that's a decision that's going to be made sometime in the early part of 2014. Oh, next year then. Yeah. That's good. So, Mr. Mayor, I want to take the time out to say thank you for coming oh, on my pleasure. Revere yeah, TV. It was, great it was an to honor see to have you here. Nice God to bless talk you. To the my pleasure. <laughs> All right. May God bless you. God bless our troops, the United States of America, and the people of Revere. And again, thank you for taking the time to come on our TV show. My pleasure. And the people, I'm sure, will love to see you so you can say hello to them. <laughs> well, hello. <laughs> thank you for listening. Till next time. Mm -hmm.